Hello, my darlings, and welcome back to yet another episode of Radio Wasteland, the best in paranormal talk radio. I'm your host, Chauncey Hallworth. This is my co-host, Kara Kittrick. Hello. Kara, do you have any news for us today? Yes, I do. So, a mysterious black ring of smoke appeared above Disneyland last week. This ring was captured on video by a Disneyland patron. Uh, Strangely, this type of object has been spotted before, above a military base in 1957. It was later included in the Condon Report, a U.S. Air Force report on UFO encounters. Why were the aliens visiting Disneyland? Well, the park closed four days later because of coronavirus. They probably wanted to enjoy the rides one last time. A spokesperson for the Chinese Foreign Ministry speculated yesterday that the coronavirus might not have originated in China, but rather have been developed by the U.S. Army, making reference to a popular conspiracy theory on Chinese social media that stated the virus could have come from one of the 300 athletes from the U.S. who attended the 7th Military World Games in Wuhan back in October. This is, of course, thought to be false, according to information gathered by the World Health Organization. And finally, Harvey Weinstein, in a bizarre rant just before he was sentenced to 23 years in prison, compared the Me Too movement to McCarthyism, claimed he'd been falsely accused, and that he and men in general were, quote, totally confused, unquote, about feminism. The speech was rambling, lasted for about 10 minutes, and it's a little unclear exactly what he was trying to say. Back to you, Chauncey. Uh, you know, the the ring of smoke above Disneyland, I, I immediately on this one go to some sort of like demonic halo or something. <laughs> That's kind like of that. what it looks like. It looks like an omen of doom. I mean, let's right. not mince words. It's like, you know, the dark mark in Harry Potter. You right. see it floating above something. You're like, oh, something bad has happened right. here. Yeah. But that that's what it looked like. Uh, the video is worth watching. It's, it's kind of freaky looking. So where did this happen before I remember us reporting on this? You uh, said that there were similar sightings somewhere. Yeah, I don't know that room. we'd reported on it, but it was at a military base. Um, I want to say it was in West Virginia. Well, I've looked up a couple of these. Okay, then I must be pulling from my own brain here because I've looked up a couple of these. and Well, so, yeah, you're right. These have happened a few times. And and what excuse did they give for them last time? There seemed to be a reason last time. Um, It's... Like, they don't know. It is still unidentified. I I I think, like, commenters online have said, you know, oh, it's a swarm of birds or... (laughs) <laughs> just flying in a ring that's creepy which is too. also that's terrifying creepy, yeah exactly you know? <laughs> or you know oh it's smoke produced by the rides which right. i don't know about terrifying but a little unsettling if yeah. you're planning to get on one of those rides I, but I, uh it's not the smoke produced by the ride that for one i think it's a little weird that any of the rides are diesel powered <laughs> but um you know i i kind of imagine them all to be electric but um, uh, yeah, <laughs> you know, so. I imagine some guy with a wrench in there kicking it, you know, making sure that it they're, works. They're just right. wood burning rides. They've right, been yeah. there since you know it's, the 1840s. And it's they've just fully, got guys shoveling branches into yeah. a furnace, right? And they're working off the newfangled technology of steam power. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, they're steam power. Just yeah. steampunk Disneyland, which would actually be awesome. Oh, totally. It's like Harry Potter already. I want to go to the Harry Potter world. That's yeah. like the one I want to go to the most. Universal Studios and Harry Potter world. Indeed. So. Legoland. I mean, Harry Potter. Well, Harry Potter is kind of steampunk. It's got that sensibility. Yeah. But like, yeah. it's, you know, it's magic, not steam. But I guess that's how most steampunk actually is. Right. And that's how the exciting invention of steam power looks to people these days. <laughs> <laughs> Indistinguishable from magic. The steamboat can carry you down a river 20 miles an hour. Yeah. I don't think I'm getting away from uh, possible rampant Satanism going on at Disneyland, though. Uh, it's possible. It One commenter said that this ring had been sighted also like a few years earlier in Disneyland too. Right. So well, are I mean, they doing dark rituals? Yes. Sacrificing a kid every couple of years. It makes sense. <laughs> no know. one would notice. Nothing has ever made this much sense before. <sighs> 
you, you're right. And honestly, I didn't even think of that when I, I, you know, I was on the aliens kick, but some kind of physical manifestation of the darkness of Disneyland makes your slippage much more Karen. sense. You're slipping. I am. Uh, all right. Corona developed by the U S sure. We've all entertained this delivered by athletes. No, I'm not <laughs> going with that one, but, um, We've all entertained that, you know, the joke yeah. around here lately has been that uh, coronavirus was made and put out by Amazon to secure a world of mail order shipping. <laughs> Which I could believe, actually. You know, so that's that's, that's where I'm shockingly plausible. The, uh, <laughs> right. With that conspiracy. But I don't know. You know, I mean, they, what's the term going around the boomer remover, you know, on an economic level, you know, clearing out old people would help the economy in 10 years. So, I mean, it's possible a government would do this, but I don't think any government actually believes that I feel they like have enough control of a virus to release it on yeah. purpose. And I feel like if a government was like responsible, they would not be actually trying to stop it. Right. They would probably be making a token effort to deal with the virus, but, you know, just doing everything they could in the background to make sure that their efforts are totally ineffective and the containment fails away. Oh, right. So do you think that, hmm. right. <laughs> was anthrax a virus or a bacteria? I think anthrax is a bacteria. I'm not an anthraxologist. I don't know. Germ but. warfare with bacteria makes sense to me, but germ warfare with a virus just seems like you are poking the lion with a yeah. stick with a piece of nerf on the end. I mean, it's kind of like martial arts with a hand grenade. I mean, right. There's, yeah. you know, there's no controlling it. Although there was that cool movie equilibrium where they did martial arts with guns. Gun Kata. Yeah, that was Kata. that was rad. Yeah, is that what it that was? That was called? a really good movie. I think I think that's what they called it in Equilibrium. Yeah, that was cool. Uh, although I, I think the term came from some other thing. Yeah, they kind of co-opted it. And of course, speaking of coronavirus, we are hitting this point now where just this morning it came out that uh, keep gatherings less than ten people. Jeez. Yeah. Well, that. Actually, that's fine. I don't remember the last time I was in a room with more than 10 people. Right, right. I'm going to have to have all my friends over and have them have all their friends over. <laughs> exactly, in order yeah. to get 10 people in the room. And then Harvey Weinstein, uh, the Me Too movement like McCarthyism. Yeah. Uh, I get why he would say that. Um, but, of course, he's, you know, yeah. he's not the person to say it. You know, if maybe a guy like Louis C.K. said it, I might go like, man, I get where he's coming from. You're still being a little crap about it. But, you know, but Harvey Weinstein was a straight up rapist. Yeah. You know, I don't know if that counts as like the Me Too movement is is failing us. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that counts as finally rich and powerful rapists are going to prison sometimes. Right. Like very few times but still that's more than zero so. you know as a middle-aged white man though i watch it go on and i understand why white men are just like oh my god you know because part of me feels that like oh god you know am i gonna get in some sort of trouble the other part of me knows that i've been married for 16 years and there's no chance in hell that's gonna happen but yeah. but you know it's like uh here here's to put it into this weird perspective of what could happen i watched this show I think I've told you this before about a about like a uh, child pornography ring. Okay. And this guy's home with his family, and the feds b- bust in the door, and they arrest this guy because he's got a bunch of child porn on his computer. Sure. His family leaves him. He goes to prison. Well, years later, it turns out that his computer had been hacked and that other people were storing and serving up information from his computer, you know? So that's kind right. of the paranoia yeah. that comes to people. Don't get me wrong. I'm just putting out some understanding out there to no, I, other I people get it. like yeah. me to, to remind mm-hmm. them that this is not what's going on and supporting other people to get the equalities that you have is definitely where we should be going. So having a little fear, it's not uncommon that doing the right thing can be a little bit scary. So, you know, yeah. tighten up your pants and let's go, you know, well, we'll you know, right. whenever I'm like at the TSA or something, like when I'm trying to get on a flight or just whenever I'm around the police in general, I'm just like, 
what if I have a gun and I don't realize, you know, is that, that kind sort of, of thing crosses my mind is too. that kind of anxiety? Like, <laughs> yeah. and I'm like, I've literally never held a gun in my life. I don't know that I've right. actually yeah. been in the same room as a handgun ever. Mine's a little so more like, realistic, but not much more realistic. It's like, Oh crap. Where did I put that pocket knife I had when I was 12? Do I have it in my pants? pocket now? <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, it, it's that kind of thing. And I'm just like, Oh no. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. And what and, if I'm actually a serial killer and they know, but I don't because it's a born identity kind of situation. Oh, Will yeah. they believe that I've lost my memories? Well, this coronavirus situation right now is a prime example of, yeah. you know, how people can react when they're scared. Oh, and, absolutely. Uh, you know, the big thing in the news right now, they bought up all the freaking baby formula. So that they can, what, make cookies and bake bread while they're in, I mean babies need baby formula i'm adopted <laughs> my mom was not making any breast milk i had to be raised on baby formula there are a lot of babies out there who need yeah. baby formula. no that's i mean and these people who are great. buying it up they're planning on like making mac and cheese with it wait what no seriously yeah no i <laughs> baby formula mac and cheese as a replacement for milk that's still kind of I don't know. That's just well, weird. I mean, to baby me. formula is not dehydrated lady breast milk. Well, I know. I just. Although it is I'm still just, gross. Don't get me I'm wrong. I'm just being squeamish, I guess. Yeah, yeah. But also, now is not the time. <laughs> now, yeah, no. <laughs> now is definitely not your the time. Baby macaroni. Right, yeah. Yeah, that's what we were joking about. It's like, you know, uh, Terry just went shopping today. All the meat was gone from Safeway. And yeah. Jazz is just all, what are these people going to do during their, during their? oh, no, we're quarantined. Let's barbecue and make milkshakes. Yeah, it was meat and frozen berries. So, right. yeah, like, yeah. a bunch of, like, people on keto diets are right. just, yeah, yeah. like... Totally. <laughs> buying up all the meat and just making themselves like organic smoothies and right. just well for those of you out there on a keto diet beef. i can guess <laughs> that one way to lose weight fast would be to get the coronavirus that's probably true so you know don't beat yourself although up. i don't know if it causes weight loss but it it might just make you too fatigued to do anything. i think it causes lack of appetite does it though i think that's like one of the you things ever had pneumonia well, okay, no, I haven't. I have. And well, I mean, you've had sicknesses that are like it, and it causes a lack of appetite. Okay, interesting. I didn't realize Just that. being sick in general makes you yeah. lay around and moan into a pillow. True. I mean, yeah, fatigue is definitely part of it. Right. But yeah, it's, yeah. I just, it's there's, not, there's not a lot of like I'm looking gastroenteritis. I'm at the silver lining here, thing. Kara. The okay, silver I, lining I on it. the coronavirus is, if I get it, I'm hoping to lose a couple pounds. Possibly all of them. All pounds. <laughs> Hoping to lose all pounds. Or or how how many pounds is the human soul? Two point seven grams or something. I'm gonna yeah, end up losing I, that much. I forget. Yeah, that <laughs> you're gonna cut down your weight just right. the weight of the human soul. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The yeah. rest of me is gonna be there and dead yeah. and cold. Yeah, but you know, then you can be an awesome poltergeist. That's true. All right, you're listening to Radio Wasteland coming up on break time after that. Who knows? Visit Radio Wasteland at Instagram at Instagram.com slash Radio Wasteland. All right. Welcome back to Radio Wasteland and our guest, Dr. Michael P. Masters. Uh, you know, it's weird for a... Uh, educated gentlemen such as yourself to actually be interested in the things that we're actually interested in. So I think I'm going to start right out of the gate here and ask you, how did you get here? How did you get interested in UFOs? Uh, well, it's actually been sort of a lifelong pursuit. I was very young when it happened. I was only eight years old. And I overheard a story that my father was telling to some friends that were over at our house. And he described a UFO encounter that many people have had, a same, the same sort of close encounter scenario with the bright light in the sky. Uh, clearly it wasn't a satellite, it wasn't headlights. Visit darted Radio toward Wasteland the truck, Instagram darted away, Instagram. shot up into the sky. Radio Not Wasteland. something you can explain with conventional aircraft or anything else. And it got me interested in what exactly this is. And... 
what was really um i think a life altering situation though is just after that he probably trying to figure out this phenomenon on his own level like because he was baffled by what just happened he bought whitley communions or whitley striber's book whitley strieber i think is how you actually yep. pronounce that i literally just talked to him like three hours ago so yeah, it's right. weird that i just <laughs> mispronounced his name yep. but whitley strieber's book communion uh he had bought that to try to unravel this mystery or at least get some understanding of it and uh i looked up on the the living room shelf and saw that book and then there was just this sort of uh mental image that popped in my head with uh, a a primitive uh ancestral human chimpanzee like individual a modern human and then this alien on the right side like all kind of put in the same sequence and i wondered if maybe there could be some sort of connection there like a phylogenetic connection where um we're related to them where we're all related where they're related to us we're related to these human-like beings of the past and um yeah from that point on it just became sort of a passion project of mine i went to college to find this out i started out in physics and astronomy because i thought that was a good place to start and i'm kind of glad i switched to anthropology there's a lot of other people who are also researching this question in the context of physics and um yeah that was definitely going to be my my follow-up question to this oh, is is um is working so a lot of the people down in the ufo trenches you know feel that okay people know at some level people know they're keeping it covered up and stuff like that you know so your experience in a more collegiate situation uh you know is is probably quite different you know and a lot of the time you know your your teaching might teach that out of you uh you know how, yeah. how do you get past that well you know honestly we're at a place now where it I, I feel like we're at a precipice of change to be honest where historically and until very recently this isn't something we could really discuss and and it's certainly not trying to come out and say this is real and this is p potentially what it is which is what i'm trying to do with this book and others have as well but you're right in the context of um academia it's it's frowned upon it's ridiculed there's stigma but honestly i haven't felt that i get a little bit from some of my academic colleagues who will just have a knee-jerk reaction they'll turn a blind eye they'll say well it's ufos it's aliens he's clearly a crack body he's crazy but the the onus is on those people the burden of proof is on those people they're not doing their job as scientists and just turning away from this phenomenon that's been uh coming out in mainstream media outlets that the uh, the navy has obviously been talking about that there's this since the new york times piece in 2017 so i i kind of feel like we're at a turning point and a moment of reckoning if you will where these people are going to look back and say you know what this was our jobs our job was to investigate big questions and to try to understand things using the scientific method and I, I feel like they're failing society. I feel like they're failing uh, the UFO community and people that are interested in this, people that are asking questions. I feel like they're failing science, to be honest. And so I'm perfectly happy to, to not only stick my head out, but also to call out my academic colleagues who are going to be high and mighty and say, well, no, we're going to stick to this arcane notion that this isn't real and all the people that talk about it are crazy we should all be talking about this and and i'm happy to to get out there and, and stick my head out and try to lead that charge and others are it's not just me there's a lot of other people doing this uh, earlier you mentioned your book there for a second um uh identified flying objects a multidisciplinary scientific approach to the ufo phenomenon that is a um a large title to to dissect uh, can you can you break that up for us a little bit? 
You're right. That's I, mean, I can't even remember it. I wrote the damn book. Well, um, <laughs> I have notes. <laughs> All right. I should keep notes. But no, it's it, it, and, and even the title itself sounds a little narcissistic. Uh, but but as I explained in the first chapter of the book, I'm not trying to say that I solved this. I figured it out. Right. I'm not trying to say that I identified this thing and this is the be all and end all. But rather, just um, change the narrative around it. The main right. thing I was trying to do is get away from UFO. And, and the whole UAP thing is an attempt to do that as well. It's not just me. Again, a lot of people are trying to just move us past what it is. And so by changing it to IFO in the book, it automatically takes people's minds away from UFO. And so it was more of a, a semantic thing, I guess you could say. The premise of the book is really that... Um that you're taking um, UFO factoids, information and stuff that we've collected over the years, and you're addressing them from a time traveling human standpoint, other than a UFO standpoint in order to try to wrap it in another possible narrative? Uh, yeah, I mean, in a sense, but almost the flip side of that, where I'm trying to take long term uh, evolutionary changes in human culture and biology, and then put those in the context of UFOs. So, so I, I do bring in a couple of um, uh, abduction reports and reports of close encounters, but for the most part, it's really trying to just look at what's happened to us in the past. What are the dominant trends in human evolution, both culturally and biologically, that if they extend into the future, would make us look and act like these things that are commonly referred to as extraterrestrials or aliens. And one of the biggest things that I focus on, one of the most dominant trends in hominin evolution is an increase in brain size, what we call encephalization, a reduction in facial anatomy, both the mid and lower face, which is known as a reduced prognathic face. And, and if those same trends continued, as they have throughout the last six million years, we're likely to have bigger heads and smaller faces and specifically more globular crania, bigger, rounder skulls. And that's a more recent trend. That's just been in the last 200,000 years. That's one of the traits that defines humans, modern humans, anatomically modern, homo sapiens sapiens. So if those same trends continued, we would look very much like these gray aliens or um, these Asian or uh, Nordic looking individuals that are so commonly described in these instances of close encounters and especially abductions where they get a really good look at these individuals. So, so to answer your question, I mostly approach it from the, the context of long-term changes in hominin evolution, bringing in also astrobiology, astronomy, and the physics of time, time travel, which obviously needs to be addressed. And then just try to, to paint a holistic picture of how they might be us. They might just be us in the future coming back to study their own past in the same way that I would as a biological anthropologist if I had access to that technology. Yeah, so part of it, uh, you know, as ridiculous as, as it sounds, is um, the argument I had a ki as a kid, and that is, uh, why do all the aliens across the galaxy on Star Trek look like people with weird foreheads? <laughs> Yeah, you know? and not just back then, but uh, the show The Orville, uh, yeah. Seth, oh, yeah. uh, what's his name, Seth McFarlane. Uh, McFarlane. Yeah. yeah, same thing. And they all speak English. Right. They're all very Caucasian for some reason. Sometimes they'll throw in, you know, the token black person or Asian person. But for the right. most part, they're just white people speaking English. With weird. That's words. what we know. We can associate yeah. with that. But that's not what anything, I don't even say people, there wouldn't be people on other planets. If they had a different gravity, different distance from their sun, different chemistry, different coding system, they're not likely to have the DNA that we have or the RNA that preceded that. They're not going to look anything like us, let alone be able to communicate with us in our own languages, be close enough to us uh, to be able to find us and to come here and to be slightly more advanced. Like all of those things just scream future humans if you think about it i think another pop culture reference as long as we're doing that that's sort of pertinent to the conversation is absolutely stellar 
where it turns yeah. out spoilers everyone but really you all should have seen interstellar by now it's a great movie. by now everybody um, should it's a great movie <laughs> <laughs> at, at the end of the movie these aliens who were helping humanity survive this environmental crisis the entire time it's figured out they're us they've just learned to manipulate space time and you know by extension yeah. time travel basically so yeah. it, this is this is an idea that's floating around. In, Absolutely. It's been around for a long time. Yeah. And what was so cool about publishing this book is that I realized just how many other people have thought this for so long. And and I never claim that this is an original idea. I mean, it, it was to me as an eight-year-old. In that sense, it is original. But there's so many people that have been talking. It showed up in songs. Um, it's it's showed up in little clips and movies. There's people that have written papers about it. It's, it, and that's because it makes sense. And that's because potentially that's what is actually happening here. So I'm just, I'm, I'm building a case around this from my research, from my work as an anthropologist and the research I've done in physics and astronomy and astrobiology. But there's so many others contributing to this right now. Uh, Diane Tessman just published a book uh, last month, I think, called uh, "What Future Humans and the UFOs that lays out a case for this exact same thing. And she's, it's been the same sort of lifelong pursuit for her as well. Uh, there's, there's a lot of researchers advocating for this because it, it makes sense. So in a sense, what we're seeing is like a paradigm shift in the UFO Hopefully, I mean, at least, at least, at least something to bring into the conversation, you know, I'm, I, and, and there may still be some extraterrestrial aspect to this. I'm not saying we should replace the extraterrestrial hypothesis, but we should at least consider this as a valid alternative to that, especially based on just how logical it is, how much sense it makes in the context of what people report. Yeah, Kara's pointed out several times on the show that uh, if you're able to travel faster than the speed of light, you're able to travel through time. And that really one will not be achieved before the other one necessarily if it's a matter of speed. Um, right, they're the same. And we should probably talk about like the physics of time travel later. Absolutely, but. yeah. It's an important <laughs> part. Other than the hominid uh, resemblance do we have any other information that really would lead us to this conclusion? You know, I guess the research ex aspect of what they're doing to us when they get here or what they appear to be doing. But, you know, what would you say? Well, I mean, obviously, people's individual accounts, their experiences, those should not be discounted. But it's not it's not something we can count as evidence in a strictly scientific sense, even uh I, like eyewitness accounts that holds up in court. That's something that is taken into account in the, the litigation process. But in science, it doesn't really matter what people see unless it's re, unless it's statistically quantitatively observable. It doesn't really matter to us. So, so with that said, that's, and, and one of the main reasons I don't, uh, I don't hinge this hypothesis or, what I present in the book on the reality of this phenomenon. These people should be taken seriously and especially how consistent their reports are and how similar they are across all of these different people. I get emails every day, sometimes four or five a day from people that want to tell me their story and they're so similar. And, and you're right. One of the most common things is that they're taken up, they're naked, they're laying on a table these beings are walking around who are bipedal to start with the thing that defines the hominin lineage is upright walking. They have eyes in the same place. Their mouth is in the same place. They have slightly bigger heads and smaller faces as we talked about previously, but they do exactly what I would do as a paleoanthropologist. If I had access to that technology, like I've worked on digs all around the world and we're scraping through dirt or blasting through rock to try to get little tiny pieces of what humans did, what hominins did, our ancestors. But if we could actually go back through time, if we could spin back through layers of time rather than layers of dirt in a stratigraphical sense, we could learn so much more. And, and 
taking skin samples, hair samples, fecal samples, which is probably what gave rise to the anal probing thing. We learned, I, I gave this lecture today in class. The reason we know that Neanderthals ate 7,000 calories per day of mostly meat is from their poop. What, what are known as coprolites. We, we find their poop in caves. It's dried out. We can dissect that. We can see what's in it. We know they ate 7,000 calories per day of mostly meat from their turds. Why wouldn't we take turds of people? Why wouldn't we get that information? Take DNA, take blood. Well, I think a big part of the argument tends to be when people are coming at it from that angle, and, and this is where uh, things get weird, is technology. So I'm just going to huck a bunch of, of this out there at you, and then, and then you can huck stuff back at me. But this is, this is uh, devil's advocacy. Sure. So uh, for one, time travel would potentially damage the past or, or change, you know, causality, all that stuff. And then another argument tends to be that if they were able to do this, uh, aliens or, or time travel, you know, in general, this is a generalized argument, sure. um, they could easily keep themselves from being discovered. And then also, if they were to scan your body, we have x-rays and stuff like that. Why would they be taking parts of us? Mm -hmm. So I realized that was a whole lot of questions. All at no, once. I wrote them all down. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the first one, the, but those the whole, tend to be the general skeptic arguments. Yes, yeah, and yeah. and there's a couple others that come up a lot too that I could address too, especially related to like the movement of planets and how would they not only find when we are but where we are mm -hmm. in time. That's one that gets brought up a lot too. Um, but no, a lot of people have this sense, and, and unfortunately, it, it comes from pop culture references. It comes from things like uh, Time Cop or Marty McFly and Back to the Future. But if you study uh, time, and, and I'm not a physicist, but also physicists don't have a mon monopoly on time. Other people have been studying it for much longer, philosophers anthropologist, obviously physicists as well, I do tend to side with the physicists more in their conventional notion of block time. And block time or landscape time is this um, way of understanding time as a four-dimensional entity. And we can either think of it as three dimensions that are moving or four dimensions that are static. And we impose movement in the context of our brains, our consciousness as biological entities where we feel like we're moving through this. And, and for anybody who's ever taken mushrooms or done LSD, you get a disconnect from that. You get a sense that, wait, like the way I'm perceiving this isn't really the way this is. When we go to bed at night, it's the same thing. We go to sleep, we wake up instantly, and all of a sudden, it's the morning. But what happened to that eight hours where we were asleep and doing things? So, so time is more malleable in the sense of our consciousness and in the sense of our perception of it, how we move through it as biological entities. But in the context of the physics of time, entropy and the movement through time, uh, ever since Einstein published his theory of general relativity and specifically the 10 field equations that went along with it back in 1915, there's been numerous solutions to those field equations that have shown that you can create closed time-like curves by rotating a massive or highly energetic uh, ring, sphere, or oftentimes disk that's able to warp space-time so that you can return to the past. So if it's not forbidden by the laws of physics, and if we've already kind of been discovering how we might do that with something that looks a lot like a UFO, a rotating disc-like craft, then it makes sense how that might be the time machine itself, how that, right. how that UFO might be the thing that allows them to travel back into the past. And so even beyond the biological traits, the physical traits that we share with them, the derived characteristics, unique derived traits, as we call them in anthropology, that craft itself would seem to indicate that it's capable of bending space-time to the extent that it can travel to the past. So, to get to your specific question of what happens, within the context of block time, there is no separation between past, present, and future. In the presence of a time machine, you can have the future 
a future cause create a past effect. We're used to thinking of things that happen to us. We have this uh, thing that we do that creates an effect shortly thereafter in the future. But you can have the opposite take place. And if you went back in time, if you went back to study the past and you interacted with the past, we think of this like change that would happen. But anything that you did in that past has already uh, materialized before we even went back to do it. Any change that took place, any effect of traveling into the past has already manifested itself before you even left to do it. Because of the essence of block time, there is no separation among those things. So there's no markable. So let's say in the future, I decide to go give myself a soda right now. A soda would be here right now. That would just think, be the case. It would have already happened now because it happened in the future. And uh, Okay, so that's a, a great example. I'm glad you brought that up. Do you, if you had a memory of yourself bringing you that soda right now, mm. you can be guaranteed that once you got to six minutes in the future, you would be like, oh, I need to bring my past self a soda. And those things are constantly entwined. You have always done that. There's no escaping that. The paradox is not in it happening. The paradox is in it not happening because it's always a part of that past. Whereas if you don't receive a soda and you've got no memory of it. Then it was can, never there. You, it never you can happened assume in the first that you're place. not going to wind up time exactly. traveling and doing yeah. that thing. Something exactly. So, but if that time travel does happen, say you meet yourself now, and not even in the context of uh, six minutes later when you want a soda, but say 20 years from now, you meet yourself 20 years from now and you're older and you're like, hey man, what's life like 20 years from now? Are we still alive? Do we all kill each other? Did global warming, whatever. Um, you can know for sure that 20 years from then, you will get in some sort of craft and come back to that time to tell yourself those things. You will have always done that. Because that moment is structured that way. There's self-consistency between those two different periods of time. And this isn't my personal opinion. This is the conventional notion among physicists regarding how we understand time, how it exists in the context of block time or, or landscape time. Okay. I, I think I can wrap my brain around some of that, of course, you know. You got to give me some yeah. time to digest that one. So how about the technology? You know, um, the idea that they can, why would they allow themselves to be seen or remembered or feel the need to cut a chunk of meat instead of scan us? Why, uh, why so lackadaisical about tying up loose strings? I mean, I would, I would ask a question to that question. Like, doesn't it seem like they go out of their way to not be remembered? They wipe memories they pick people up in remote parts of the world, usually in the forest and uh, places where people aren't going to see them. Like it almost seems like they're trying to be very covert in their actions. And I'm not a ufologist, but just from uh, talking to people and from reading reports, it always seems like they're trying to just get in and get out. If they came from a different planet, different solar system, they slept all the way across the universe, you'd think they would be like, hey, we're from this nebulae thing in whatever part of the universe, but, but they don't, which to me indicates that they're really trying to not be enumerated in some way. Right. But, you know, given technological jumps in humans, if we have any reason to believe that these technological jumps are any representation of what happens in the future, just like we're saying with our body shapes and such um it would be that a future where i looked like a big-headed naked little kid that i would have some serious mind-blowing magical technology well maybe no i i i'm this is totally devil's advocacy i don't know i i'm just saying <laughs> that that tends to be the argument that the I, argument i don't think is it is i think you just made the point that yeah, and they do have some crazy technology. They seem to be thousands of years in our future. Yeah, with their technology, likely because they're uh, big-headed, naked little kids. Ten thousand <laughs> years in our future. I, didn't know I, was I had to write that out. down. That was no, that was awesome, man. I wrote that down as you were saying it. But uh, but that that would explain why they're big-headed, naked little kids, and yeah. why their technology is more advanced because they came from our future. Like, right. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, that part does make sense to me. I actually only first heard the the idea of this theory really about a year or two ago. I hadn't even really thought of the From fact where? that I'm they curious. were time travelers. Um, I think we had some video on about this guy who was wrapped up in a hoax of some alien video saying that they were time travelers from the future. Hmm. And, uh, Kara, do you remember this? It was an older guy and, uh, I, I don't, but this has been floating around in, in yeah, it's, mythology it's for, been around yeah, for a while. For a At while. Least and of course like I read, I read childhoods in, but I didn't put them together in, in, uh, this fashion. So, so being an anthropologist and studying their faces and their heads and the growth and the growth that humanity has had through our evolution, how far in the future do we think they are? Oh, man. Yeah, that's a tough question. The short answer is it depends on what they look like. Like if, they're, if they look like you, then they're probably from a pretty close point in time in our evolutionary future. If they look like a reptile or an insect, that's probably a more distant period. And, and what I usually tell people is if, if you went back in time now, okay, with the characteristics that you have, a hundred years in the past, you would look very similar to people that your clothes would look different. They'd be like, what is this thing that brought you here, DeLorean or a UFO or whatever? You go 5,000 years in the past, you still look pretty similar. 200,000 years in the past to the dawn of anatomically modern Homo sapiens sapiens, you look a little bit different. They have very primitive technology. Your technology looks tremendously sophisticated in, re in relation to theirs. You go back 2 million years in the past. Now you're the one with the big head and the big eyes and the small face and the really complex technology. You are the extra tempestrial, as I call them, or the aliens. You are that thing that we describe. So I think it just depends on when. And that's why it's so hard for me to answer that question. And, and no, many that makes people sense. You know, that. kind of blew my mind a little bit. People have asked me that. George Norrie once made me give him an answer. I was like, I, and I talk in the book about that very question a lot. And I said, George Norrie, I'm not, I'm not going to answer that because there, there's a lot of factors. And then also across different periods of time, and this is something we struggle with in paleoanthropology. There's also sex variation, differences between the sex. Males and females look different morphologically. Age variation. Are you talking about a four-year-old or a 20-year-old or a 50-year-old? They all have different morphological traits. If they come from different regions, if they're sub-Saharan African or Native American or European, they have different traits. How do you account for all of those, especially in the context of something so ethereal as abduction reports, where I describe this Asian-looking or Nordic or... Uh, insect like reptile like creature how do you say when they come from i think once we have time travel technology in the same way that once we had fire we never stopped having fire 1.8 million years ago we invented fire we harnessed the power of fire and then kept it going in that same context once we have time travel technology in the future we're going to keep having it we're going to keep that going so at the very first time that we see those people from the very first period, they're still biased on that. Why, say we do it in 100 years. Why would they come to now? They would look exactly like us. Why would they come to now? They already know everything about us. There's still archives. There's records. But it has to get to that point where we lose some of that information. It's where they care to come back and study us. So it just depends on who we see and from what time period? And it's so, hard, it's so hard to answer that question because of that. And also complicating that is the thought that, you know, maybe they have the technology to genetically engineer themselves, right? Right. Yeah, maybe, absolutely. Maybe or artificial. Takes, yeah, or exactly. artificial intelligence. Like, what about AI? Right. Like, some of these things might be robots who are, are pushed back through time to study us because it's too dangerous. Or uh, when they first start doing it, I, I wouldn't be that human. Like you talked about contact. Would you be Jodie Foster dropping through that thing 
You know, I would have, I have some serious dad issues like she did. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> to be willing to I think we all that, would. Yeah. yeah. Maybe that's what it would take. We'll all just be shitty dads so we can make a yeah. bunch of Jody Fosters. I'm to working back on it, man. Time. I'm working on it. My kids are going <laughs> to mistreat our children galaxy. for science. Yes. <laughs> that's the takeaway from this conversation. Exactly. Mistreat our children for science. <laughs> All right, you're listening to Dr. Michael P. Masters here on Radio Wasteland. Uh, all right, uh, do I call you Michael or doctor? You can call me whatever you want. Do you make your students call you doctor? I don't, actually, no. What's funny, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Is, <laughs> <Are you? laughs> uh, in a classroom environment, they tend to. If oh, they really? don't, yeah. I don't really care. Right. I'm not one of those guys that's like, I went to 10 years of right. school and you should call me this. But honestly, like, I interact with my students in ways that are very formal. Like, I, I butchered a deer, uh, a mule deer, with one of my students just like two months ago. And we're, you know, we're laying out meat on the table, drinking beers, cutting it up. Like, how am I going to make them call me Dr. Masters in that well, situation, to, you know? like Seems like that's the perfect situation where you're all, can you hand well, me a spleen, I mean, Dr. Matthews? <laughs> I taught them about anatomy and, and some important things about butchering, but right, it's, yeah. it, it was professorial, <laughs> but it's, a, it's an informal situation. So, no, just call me Mike, call me whatever. I'm, I'm not particular. Okay. Um, so, you know, earlier you used the term extra temporestrial. Uh, and of course, I got an understanding of what that term was in the context, but why don't you lay that out for us, what that really means? Well, I think our default is to say extraterrestrial. We do that without even thinking about it. And, and like you said earlier, if, if we're going to have a paradigm shift, and I'm not saying that this is going to be that, but we should at least consider other things. The term extraterrestrial innately implies that they come from a different planet. There's no way around that. Extra means outside of terror, the Latin root earth, outside of earth. So I just replaced terror with tom, the French word, and which is derived from Latin as well. So outside of time, as opposed to outside of Earth. And you hear this on ancient aliens all the time. You hear this on a anywhere. People just always say extraterrestrial. Like, that's what we're talking about. But for a paradigm shift to occur, we need to change the nomenclature associated with that. We need to have a lexicon shift to facilitate that paradigm shift. And I'm just trying to offer another alternative way of speaking about it so that we can hopefully have a different way of thinking about it. You know, of course, you don't have an answer for this question, but uh, anytime we're talking about extraterrestrial, temporestrial, non-us, <laughs> non-current us, um, the idea of motive comes along, you know. Do you think that their motive is purely anthropological? or I mean, what is the motive? Uh, yeah, you're right. I, and, and I appreciate you prefacing that question with that because I, I can't know. I haven't met them. I haven't no, asked of course them. Not. Of course, yeah. And it sucks because a lot of people have, and I haven't. So I'm a little jealous right. and spiteful right. <laughs> toward those people. <laughs> hand to um, any abducting aliens. Yeah, watching. hey, uh, <laughs> if you guys want to come down and uh, right. abduct me, like <laughs> I could. Um, but no, you're right. Like, why would they do this? And and we talked about earlier in the show how a good a good part of it, at least from my perspective, would be that it's scientific, that they're trying to get information about our evolutionary past. But I don't think it's just that. I think there's also a time tourism component to it. I think it's also just an interest in what's happened in the past, and especially throughout different periods. Like it's, it's easy to think, again, once we have time travel technology, and it could potentially exist as early as 500 to 5,000 years in the future, why would they be interested in us? But there, there's a lot that can happen in that period. There's a lot that can happen between now and then where the, that the records are lost, the information's lost, and they just want to come back and see what we were doing. But outside of that, I think there's a tourism component too. Like who wouldn't pay 
a lot of money right now. If we had this technology now, who wouldn't pay to go see the pyramids being built or, or Machu Picchu or the first cave paintings or any of those monumental or even benign moments in the past, just to watch people from whatever period you were interested in, the Nazis in Germany or anything. Like we're, we're clearly obsessed with history, but what if you could see it? What if you could actually see it? And I think, I think we would pay a lot of money to do that. So that the economic incentive might help drive time travel technology in the private sector in the same way it is now with Elon Musk and SpaceX, uh, with Amazon, all the money they're putting in. Like in the same way we're doing that with space right now, once we get close to being able to do that with time, why wouldn't we? It might be the same thing where we're trying to Virgin Atlantic, trying to take people up into space to, to see the earth from high above, or, or we just make our own rockets and then uh, crash and die in the process. Yeah, we, uh, you know, you, you're right. We do often get stuck in, in what media throws at us, you know, this, this uh, world of, um, of every, uh, basically a world that's not full of rich people wanting to do, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, time travel for money. You know, we imagine right. that money is gone someday. You know, we, we adhere to all these, these utopian uh, futures that that one doesn't tend to fall in, but sure. Why not? I mean, even if you take money out of it, like <laughs> all you really have to think is, are these creatures still going to have curiosity? Which is yeah, like, that's a good probably, point. Right. I'm, yeah. And if they do, then they're going to, they're going to come back. <laughs> Absolutely. Know, yeah, it's not just about how much money can I make from this. Like, we're still going to be interested in that. And as I talk about in the book, the most visited sites for tourism, which kind of combines the two things, like it's both money and interest, are Machu Picchu and Stonehenge and uh, the Pyramids of Giza. Like, that's where people go. That's where they visit to try to find out about the ancient past. So if you could just go there, if you could do it, yeah, you're right. Even outside of the money that's made on this side, there's still the the demand side. It's not just about supply, but demand too. It's a really good point. Well, that makes me think like from a ufology perspective, like where do UFOs usually, you know, can we identify that sort of motive in terms of the UFO sightings we know about them? I'm, the only thing I can think of is that UFOs seem to be really interested in nuclear power plants. So maybe yeah. that's going to be the craze in the future. Like, well, I mean, and, and that makes sense too in the context of them being uh, a product of us or, or not. And if, if we were to destroy ourselves, they don't exist. It comes back to that grandfather paradox thing. So obviously they have a stake in existing the thing they care about most is probably existing in the future. And who knows, like maybe they shut down a nuclear base not far from me. I gave a talk up in uh, Livingston. No, well, I did in Livingston, but Lewistown, Montana, right outside the Maelstrom Air Force Base. And they shut down that base. Why did they do that? Why would they care as like extraterrestrial beings? It seems like they would care because they're – invested in our, in their past and our future as things that need us to continue being for them to exist. So, yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree with you. I think that's definitely a factor in it. And in the presented narrative, if there is a gap in time where history is lost, you know, of course, they would be investigating the things that might create a gap in that time. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. What, and, and what else would it be other than uh, a nuclear holocaust, some sort of major disease outbreak, like any, anything would definitely disrupt it. But what, honestly, a lot of people that have read this book have come up to me and said, you know, I used to be afraid of an extraterrestrial invasion. But if you're right, mm -hmm. all that fear is gone. Because why yeah, would they, why would they kill their ancestors? Like they, <laughs> they need us to be them. And 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 it gave them comfort like they they got comfort from that and and you're right yeah if we're all in the same timeline if we're all existing as part of the same collective phylogenetic past then then they would help us not hurt us think about do a thought experiment 
think about being, uh, let's go back even farther than Homo erectus. Let's go back to Australopithecus afarensis in East Africa 3.5 million years ago. Homeboy comes down in this UFO, looks like us, but with less hair and bigger heads, smaller faces, starts doing weird things. How are you going to interpret that? How, how do you put that into the context of what you do on a day-to-day basis? Like just trying to not get eaten by uh, leopards. Oh, yeah, like, definitely God and magic. Yeah. yeah, that's your day. That's yeah. magic. That's God. That's right. a thing. And that would be that way all the way up until basically right now, like even 100 years ago. And, uh, you know, the cave paintings that we see, all of the megalithic, structures, not all of them, obviously, but certain things. So I definitely don't discount that there are things that exist in the archaeological record that could have been the product of future humans interjecting themselves in the past and then them just saying, this is the best way I can record this. This was amazing to us. We need to write this down in the only way we have. We've only had writing for like 5,000 years. What else did they have? Three and a half million years ago, two two million years ago. So they 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 put uh, you know like the owl man in the Nazca culture. Like they just put a big big headed thing on a mountain. That's the best they can do. Now we have cell phones. We can take pictures, and we still don't believe it. Even when we do that stuff, it's all fake. Those guys are making it up. It's all fake. Um, but I, I I don't think we should draw this distinction between mainstream archaeologists and um, what the actual evidence is. Because I think that's dangerous. It's a slippery slope. Science is science. Belief is belief. Those should be kept separate. And we have principles in science. We have methods in science. And we can understand things. If you want to believe things that are just rooted in how they interpret things, that's fine. We've been doing that for literally the entire history of humanity. But I don't think we should conflate one. I don't think we should confuse the two. And I think we should draw a distinction there. Yeah, what about, that's a uh, good point. Sorry. That's all right. Go it ahead, just Kate. comes up a lot with the guests we have on our show. It, we often get into conversations about sort of like the use of mainstream as a pejorative when it comes to science. And I, I think know, it's bull- a lot of what it, I mean, I think a lot of what it comes down to is, a lot of people don't really have the training, but they want to weigh in anyway, and they kind of right. have a chip on their shoulder. You know? You're absolutely right. So. And that's, that's <laughs> our failing. That's our failing as much as anybody else's. And honestly, like, uh, we, we, don't, we don't do a good job communicating with people in many ways. We write articles. We get on TV sometimes saying things on PBS or um, – and any number of documentaries that describe human evolution and the archaeological past. And it's interesting. It's tremendously interesting. But there's a segment of the population who sees us as the enemy or we're not including things that they think should be included. And that's why I think it's important to draw that distinction. And, and that's why I'm so happy to come on shows like this and to talk to people directly because it's us too. We are at fault too. It's just as much us as it is anybody else. We need to communicate to everybody. It's not just in talking in esoteric publications or on specific documentaries. We need to be talking to everybody. And so many of my anthropological colleagues, and especially in archaeology, fail to do that. They make an us versus them thing, that these people are crazy. We're right. We shouldn't be talking to them. They're idiots. They're, they're just off in left field. No, everybody, everybody should be talking with each other, but we still need to differentiate between belief and evidence. That's a very, very important distinction. Yeah. What about uh, pushback from the UFO community? Do you get any yeah. pushback from that? <laughs> More so than anybody else. It's oh, crazy. Oh, I never expected that. I never expected that to happen. Yeah, it's they're, been nuts. They're a contentious bunch. <laughs> they I, are. Suppose you discovered. <laughs> yeah, but it's 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 been it's been fun uh, too. <laughs> he says with a thousand yard well, stare I, in his I eyes. I imagine that. Yeah, totally. I imagine <laughs> that. Uh, <laughs> I imagine abductees might 
people who feel that they went through a traumatic experience might have a, a pretty adverse reaction to telling them that what they believe and they've been trying to get other people to believe is different than what they believed. And I, I would guess maybe you would get some negative. No, abductees, ab, uh, quite the opposite. Abductees have been overwhelmingly like, yeah, this feels like what happened to me. Oh, really? It's the uh, ones, yeah, it, across the board. It's been crazy. The ones the that I get pushback from are the dogmatic pragmatists who are like, it's the extraterrestrial hypothesis. And it's crazy. Like people just want it to be aliens from a different planet. And that's fine. Again, I, and I'm not saying, and I've said this many times, and I, I mentioned this in the book, I'm not trying to claim to have all the answers. I'm not saying that this is what it is, but this should be considered, and we should look at all of these abduction reports. We should look at long-term evolutionary changes and consider this as well. But many people, especially in MUFON, and I don't mean to call them out specifically, but that's the place where I felt it the most. I gave a talk at their 50th anniversary uh, conference in Irvine. I've never felt more attacked anywhere than at that conference. And it's, it's crazy because I didn't expect that. I thought, oh, I'll go talk to UFO people. Like I expected that from people in anthropology and physics and astrobiology, but no, it came from MUFON and it came from people that are just they there's sometimes charlatans that just make money off of the extraterrestrial hypothesis they've latched them so and we have that in academia too i'm used to that i've been of dealing course, with that yeah, yeah. for a long time and i realize you're not putting yeah. every mufon person into that no, you're just saying absolutely they're not. there i love yeah, mufon yeah. i mufon is a great organization i love mufon i was so honored that they asked me to speak at this conference jan harzan awesome human being. He's doing great things there. I'm not throwing them under the bus, but I just didn't expect to be persecuted so much. Not just there, but I gave a couple of MUFON talks before too. And, and maybe it's just that that's where the extraterrestrial hypothesis exists as a, a thing that people defend. I don't know. Like, that's what it's always been. So maybe I just tapped into some sort of like vein of of defense that I didn't realize exists. But no, I'm so glad you asked that question because I felt more persecution from individual, not, again, not MUFON, not the organization or specific groups, but individuals in the UFO community than I have from my scientific colleagues, which I never could have predicted 12 months ago. Sad to say that doesn't really surprise me after, you know, talking with People are people, and they, they have their opinions, and they get very yeah. emotionally invested. Well, we talk, to, uh, we talk to our guest, William Pullen, all the time about... Oh, um, yeah. He's always talking about... About the tribalism in the UFO community, especially tribalism. between nuts oh, and bolts. That's a perfect way of putting it. <laughs> yeah. But it, in a sense, I'm also glad it exists, because... Yeah, healthy how conversation. Else? Yeah, how else are we going to learn if we're not all debating every little detail of everything? And I, I, there's like a whole UFO Twitter community that I just kind of had to like step back from because it gets intense. You yeah. know, there's different Facebook groups that I interact with. But yeah, there's just so many people that are so opinionated about things and just like, ah, oh, if, if you're not on board with me, then you're wrong. But that's not what this should be. In the same way that I call out my academic colleagues for not doing their jobs as scientists to be asking questions and investigating testable hypotheses, aren't we doing a disservice in the UFO community too by just instantly throwing up hands and saying, no, you're wrong because I believe this. Like, shouldn't we all be open-minded and, and trying to figure this out together? Yeah, well, in this, in this branch of, of, you know, who are some of the other people who are, are backing up some of this work? Who are some of the other people that, that you follow that are helping you get to this? I mean, there's definitely, like I said, there's a lot of other people that have been arguing this for a while. Mm -hmm. um, I, I mentioned Diane Tessman's recent book that just came out, Future Humans and the UFOs. Um, 
Jack Sarfati has been advocating this for a long time, a physicist. And, and actually, I'm really glad that I went the biological anthropology route, the human evolution route, because there's a lot of physicists that are actually talking about that. Rich, Rich Hoffman, I was on um, Coast to Coast AM with George Knapp a few months ago, and I started out the show, and then Jack Sarfati came on, and then Rich Hoffman, all three of us, as it turns out, and I didn't know this until I was on the show, and then I walked out of my office and listened to the rest of it because it was live on radio, all have been saying the same thing, but from very different points of view. So to listen to that, and, to, and, and for George Knapp, obviously, is a legend. He's awesome. But for him to put together this show that starts with a biological anthropologist, a physicist, and uh, another scientist who have all been talking about this for so long and make the case without knowing each other or even on was amazing. It, it was so cool to be a part of that. Unfortunately, uh, we're here at the end of our, of our time with you. Uh, I'd like to uh, make sure that our audience knows uh, where, where can they get their hands on your book and specifically find out more about you and what you're teaching. But let's start with your book. Yeah, the book's on Amazon, obviously, and in other places. There's an audio book, an e-book, and a paperback. But as far as what you specifically said regarding events and other things, um, my website, which is a stupid name that I never should have even made a website based around, as it turns out, it's, it's just an abbreviated version of the book, I-D-F-L-Y-O-B-J, I'd fly obj. Dot com. I thought if I shorten it, then I don't have to, nobody has to, nobody has to type in anything anymore. That was such a 1990s mentality. Like we can all just Google stuff. So honestly, if they Google anything, it'll come up at this point. Well, uh, it's been a lot of fun having you on. Uh, it was definitely a topic that was new and exciting for us. So we had tons of questions and uh, we, we really appreciate having you on. Yeah, it was great. It was great talking to you guys. I, I appreciate you having me on. Thank you.